So I'm so excited to be joined by Patrick Redden Keefe, who is an award winning staff writer at The New Yorker magazine, author of the New York Times bestsellers Say Nothing, a true story of murder and memory in Northern Ireland, and the title we're here to discuss tonight Empire of Pain, the Secret History of the Sackler Dynasty. Today, we're going to run for about an hour. Um, for the first 30 minutes, I'm going to ask Patrick my questions, um, and I promise to try and keep it to 30 minutes, despite having an awful lot of questions, because the book was fantastic. Um, and then, as Connor said at the start, it'll be great to hear from you, and you can put your own questions to Patrick. Empire of Pain is a deeply researched and incredibly engaging tale of the Sackler family, which owned Purdue Pharma, the company behind OxyContin. The statistics behind the opioid crisis in America are hard to compute. The epidemic lasted over two decades. Over two million Americans suffer from opioid addiction, and about half a million overdose deaths happened over those couple of decades involving an opioid. Patrick came to the story when much had actually already been written about the toll this was taking on ordinary Americans, 10 years after Purdue had paid its first major settlement and executives had pleaded guilty to criminal charges. But his New Yorker article in 2017 refocused the attention on members of a billionaire family that you might know for having its name all over galleries and other artistic institutions around the world, but particularly in London. This is the family, the Sackler family, that owns Purdue, and he's done an amazing job at sort of lifting the dynasty's veil of secrecy. In the book, he expands on that article. He dives into documents released by discovery procedures in court cases against the company. And just as he did with his excellent book, Say Nothing on the Troubles in Northern Ireland, he then created this remarkably readable and pacey account of a devastating period in all too recent history. So thank you so much, Patrick. Oh, thank you. Thanks for doing this. So I wanted to start really where you start the book, which is with Arthur Sackler, which is a really interesting choice because he was actually dead by the time the OxyContin came onto the market. But you draw us a picture of a man who created the foundations, not just for Purdue, but for how the whole pharma industry operates today. Can you explain in what ways you saw that parallel? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you mentioned earlier that, you know, by the time I came into this story, there had been a great deal written about the opioid crisis already. I really started researching in, in 2016, 2017, and I became very interested in the Sackler family. And, and with this book, what I wanted to do really was not write an opioid crisis book per se, you know, not a sort of full spectrum account of the opioid crisis, because in part, I, I think, you know, such books have been written and, and, and quite well. There's some, some quite good examples of, of books along those lines. I wanted to uh, look quite closely at this one family and not just at one generation, but at three generations of the family and really kind of trace this story back to its origins. And so what that meant for me was looking at the original Sackler brothers. There were three brothers, Arthur, Mortimer and Raymond, who were uh, all physicians. They grew up the children of immigrants in Brooklyn against the backdrop of the Great Depression. And they became physicians, all three of them, um, and also businessmen. And Arthur was the oldest of the brothers. And as you say, he died in 1987. So it was a, quite a deliberate choice to devote a third of this book um, to the life of this man. But I think he lived one of those just kind of protean galvanizing lives where he was an incredibly creative force who really changed the world around him and kind of created the the situation in which subsequent generations of his family could do what they did um, and and give rise to the opioid crisis. So he was a, uh, a psychiatrist, but also involved in medical advertising. And where he made his fortune was uh, he was he was sort of the Don Draper, if you like, of pharmaceutical advertising in the 1950s. And he really reconceived the way in which drugs were sold um, and brought a lot of creative energy to that. And I would also, also argue um, uh, a little bit of um, you know, moral unscrupulousness to, to the business and made the first great Sackler fortune actually marketing Valium, another drug, which was the blockbuster drug of its day and happened also often to be quite addictive. 
So yeah, the idea so for me was to, to focus on to focus on Arthur as a kind of a way of opening up this world and and um, kind of showing you the the language uh, and the tools that his relatives would subsequently use with with OxyContin. Yeah, yeah. And and what parallels did you see between Valium and OxyContin? Oh, there are so many. I, you know, it's it's fascinating. So it's a, it's a different kind of drug, obviously, but you had this sequence basically where um, Arthur and his brothers start out working in an in an asylum in Queens, New York. This massive facility, a six thousand bed facility, and they're surrounded by all these patients who are suffering from terrible mental illnesses. And at the time, there were really quite brute force techniques for addressing this. So it was a lot of electroshock therapy. The brothers performed electro electroshock thousands of times. Um, lobotomy was coming into favor as a, as a means for dealing with this. And they sort of looked around at the time and said, if these are chemical problems, chemical imbalances in the brain, shouldn't there be chemical solutions? And eventually this drug Thorazine comes along, which is an antipsychotic. They didn't have anything to do with it, but it really revolutionized the field. And it starts this process of emptying out those asylums as all of these people are treated with Thorazine. And where Valium comes in is that the pharmaceutical companies, which were quite bullish in the aftermath of the Second World War, um, start looking at Thorazine and saying, okay, so there are only so many patients who, who are psychotic and require a, a so-called major tranquilizer. But what if you devised a minor tranquilizer? What if you devised something that is a kind of a more moderate solution for more moderate conditions? And it could be for anybody who's just a little stressed out at the end of the day. And it's out of that that Valium comes. First, there was another drug called Miltown, and then Librium, which was actually also produced by Roche and marketed by Arthur Sackler, and eventually Valium. And with OxyContin, decades later in the 1990s, you have a similar thing where the family business, Purdue Pharma, had a, a painkiller called MS Contin, which was for cancer pain, for so very severe cancer pain. And there are these conversations, and I managed to get the, the internal emails in which they have these conversations where they say, this has been a great success for us, but the problem is there's only so many people who have cancer pain. What if we could find a painkiller that was also an, an opioid, so derived from the opium poppy, but we could market it for moderate pain, not just severe pain. That would be a much, much bigger market. So the, the, the pivot is very similar with both drugs. Yeah, yeah, that's re really fascinating. And I think you do a good job of kind of drawing those parallels and you can you can see quite as you say how um arthur has his fingers in pies all around the farmer industry in that sense um what, what similarities did you then see because we get to the next generation of the sacklers the, the ones some of whom are much more hands-on in purdue itself um and and one of whom richard sackler arthur's nephew who becomes an executive at purdue and helps launch oxy content did you did you see there were parallels between the two of those? And was that an inheritance that was sort of actively passed down or just was, you know, um, seen as a, a model of how to do things? Yeah, I, this is a question I thought about so much as I was working, because um, from the outside, there's a tendency to talk about the Sackler family as if it's a monolith. And of course, once you get into it and you look closely, you realize that, in fact, there are all kinds of animosities and rivalries and jealousies and petty grievances, uh, feuds that last for years. And so um, it, it's a strange thing, right, because it's not as though Richard Sackler, who is the for those of you uh, keeping track at home, is the son of Raymond Sackler, who is Arthur's younger brother. Uh, so Arthur's nephew, Richard, kind of steps into center stage and in, in book two of the three books in, in Empire of Pain. Um, it's not as though Richard apprenticed with his uncle Arthur uh, and Arthur taught him everything that he knew. I think it's, it's much more the case that Richard actually learned from his father and his other uncle Mortimer. Um, but I do think that there are these family traits and um, you know, from, from the outside, I, I think there's a tendency when people look at this story, they, they hear about this family which made billions and billions of dollars, became one of the wealthiest families in the world uh, through the sale of this drug, which has this terrible legacy. And so it's this kind of strange idea of a family that um, became fabulously wealthy and put its name on all of these elite institutions, cultural institutions and universities, um, but actually made its money in this way that's quite grotesque and led to a great deal of human uh, 
misery. And so the tendency from the outside is to say, oh, well, greed is the through line here. And I think there is greed all along the way and ambition. But for me, the, the, the most uh, revealing and consistent family trait is something a little bit more subtle, which is, say you have a theory, you're a creative person and you, you develop an entrepreneurial or a scientific idea and you decide to, to you know, bring it to life, see if it works. The quality that I think links Arthur and, and Richard is that when they're wrong, they refuse to see it, is that they refuse to admit contrary evidence. And so they'll sort of have a wager, a gamble, and then life will start sending them these, these signals that actually they, they might have miscalculated. And at that point, there's a kind of moral blindness, a sort of refusal to entertain the idea. And with Arthur, there's a bunch of instances in which I describe this sort of thing happening in the book. With Richard, it takes on a much more dramatic context, right? Because you, you sell a drug that you, you market as a wonder drug that's never addictive. And then in short order, people start telling you that you know, pe people are dying taking your drug. And I think it's a very interesting question, right? Is, is not necessarily the, the initial calculation you make and how rash or, uh, um, or, or reckless it was to make that calculation. It's what happens when the world starts telling you you were wrong and people are dying. Uh, from a product that you put out into the world, do you slow the train down? Do you stop the train? Or do you do what Richard did, which is speed it up? Yeah, I think I, I think the anecdote that um, that re you're really reminding me of there is when I, I think it's someone else in the family, one of the the wives who who sort of said, you know, well, no, was talking about how the family his name had been tarred and how hard it was for children for their kids at school, and she said something like, well, no one think of the children. And that, you know, you just hit home because you're like, oh, what about the children of all these people who are overdosing and, and, and suffering from opioid abuse? Yeah, there's a kind of I think there's a kind of myopia. I mean, this was another thing that I reflected on as I was working on the on the book. And I, I should make clear for 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 people tuning in that this is a you know, it's a biography of three generations of a family. But the family did not cooperate with me uh, and, in fact, has been threatening to sue me um, since I since before I started writing um, and so one of the things that was fascinating for me as I went through their lawyers and public relations representatives and sort of tried to get a sense of how they see the world is the myopia that comes with being uh, so wealthy and surrounded by people who who think it's their job to, to, to reaffirm your every blinkered notion about the world around you. It's this kind of strange sense in which you would think, or I would have thought from the outside, that if you were if you were worth billions and billions of dollars, you could have access to the best possible counsel. And yet, increasingly, what you notice, and the Sacklers are hardly alone in this situation, is that is that actually people can end up incredibly out of touch because they're surrounded by yes men uh, who keep telling them, "Oh yes, you're right, you're right," even when the things they're saying are are laughably off base. Yeah. Yeah, you really bring that out well. Let's take a step back and actually talk about what happened with the marketing of OxyContin. Um, you know, that is you know a huge part of why OxyContin, you know, sold so well, and then also why the company's behavior became under such scrutiny. You know, how did Purdue sell OxyContin in a way that was different from what came before? So the, the issue really in the 1990s at the point where OxyContin is introduced is that for thousands of years, humans had known that products derived from the opium poppy have this kind of interesting set of qualities. They have this amazing therapeutic power, which is that they can relieve terrible pain. But the twinned with that comes this downside, which is that they can be ferociously addictive. And this is not new. You know, it's one of these things that we kind of learn it and relearn it you know, from opium uh, to, you know, to morphine and heroin. I mean, you know, each time around, we seem to learn it again. But as a consequence, in the 90s uh, and up to that point, there was a, a reluctance among physicians to overprescribe these types of drugs, a sense that this was something you kind of you keep it on the top shelf and you reach for it when you absolutely need it, when other courses of treatment have failed. 
or when someone is, uh, you know, at the end of life and you don't have to worry about uh, ad addiction issues. And so Purdue comes along with OxyContin and there was a very conscious decision to do a couple of things. First, they said, as I mentioned earlier, we don't want to market this as a cancer drug. Uh, we want this to be a painkiller really for everyone, for people who have back pain, sports injuries, post-operative pain, chronic pain, fibromyalgia, on and on and on and on. Um, and we don't want it to be a kind of nuclear solution that you graduate to only when other things haven't worked. So there was a the tag phrase actually that they used, a marketing phrase for OxyContin. They said, it's the one to start with and it's the one to stay with. And the, I know, which is amazing in retrospect <laughs> to contemplate, but of course, if what you're looking to do is sell pills, then yes, that's a hell of a formula. Um, the, um, so the, the problem that they had was that there was going to be a, a reluctance among physicians to follow along with that plan. And so what ended up happening was this huge marketing blitz in which they set out very consciously to change the mind of the American medical establishment about the dangers of opioids and to say, actually, this is all hysteria. All right. Are we on? We're on. Let's go. All okay. right. I'm so sorry about that. Okay. So I was just telling the audience that what I was going to ask you about was the uh, how the regulator reacted, because, of course, we, we expect them to, to step in in situations like this. What happened? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. The, the Sackler family occasionally... Um, people make this comparison where they say they're basically drug dealers, right? That they sold an addictive product. It's a chemical cousin of heroin uh, and caused a lot of misery and made a lot of money. And what they say is, well, wait a second. All we ever did was sell a drug that was approved by the Food and Drug Administration. And um, that's true. And in some ways, I think, you know, as with many issues in in, in the business world, what is what is scandalous is not what's illegal, but sometimes what's legal. Uh, in the case of the FDA, a really interesting thing happened, though, and it's a story I tell in the book, which is that OxyContin was approved for sale to U.S. consumers, but also the marketing claims about the drug were approved, including these claims that it was you know, potentially less abusable than other opioids on the market and so forth. And the person at the FDA who had to sign off on this was a gentleman by the name of Curtis Wright. And he was an FDA official uh, who was in charge of really shepherding this process and then um, giving the sign off, not just saying that the drug was safe and, and, uh, and that it worked, but also approving these specific marketing claims. And he did in record time. And not long afterward, he decided to leave government. And not long after that, he went to work at, you guessed it, Purdue Pharma, the company he'd been regulating for three times his government salary. So this is one of these interesting things that comes up again and again in the book where I don't think there's anything illegal about that. Uh, you know, it's a kind of soft corruption, right? Where it's not that they're sliding him a suitcase full of money under a table. But I think anybody looking at that situation would tell you that there's there's more than a whiff of impropriety if a regulator uh, makes a significant determination like that and then leaves government and joins the company at a much bigger salary. Yes, yes. It's hard to talk about these things without almost sounding too cliché, even the revolving door and the attitude of asking um, forgiveness rather than permission. It's, um, but yeah, Absolutely. you definitely have many examples of that um, in the book. Uh, you, you mentioned a couple of times how um, prolific the family were at putting their names on things and, and how um, they you know, were philanthropic donors all over the world. I was I was interested that you start again with Arthur and you describe this sort of insatiable desire to acquire. And, and I was really interested in what you thought the psychology behind that was. Oh, it's so complicated. And, and to me, very fascinating. I mean, it's one of the most intriguing aspects of this story. I, um, you know, I, I grew up in Boston and uh, after high school, I worked for a year before I took kind of a gap year before I went to college and I worked in Harvard square at a theater and there was a Sackler museum at Harvard 
And then I went off to New York for college and I was at Columbia where the Sackler name is everywhere. And on weekends, I would go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art where the Sackler wing, which I'm sure you know, many people watching have, have been to, the, there's this ancient Egyptian temple that's been transplanted into this beautiful uh, wing of the Met with a great wall of glass. And that's the Sackler wing. And, you know, over the years, I, I lived in London, um, where the Sackler name is everywhere, and in Washington, D.C., where there was a Sackler gallery on the mall. And you see that name all over the place. And so part of what was interesting for me was kind of excavating the history of what it is that inclined this family to put the name up with a kind of mania. And in, in Arthur's case, to just collect and collect and collect. So he starts in the 1940s and 50s collecting Asian art, and it becomes almost a kind of madness. It's a thing where he, he's constantly having to acquire new stuff. Um, I talk in the book about how it, there's a time when, when the objects he's buying are accumulating in the house at such a rate that he doesn't even unpack them. You know, he's just kind of constantly looking for the next thing. And so he develops this world-class collection. And there is this sense always that, um, you know, they'll donate the art, but there's always a, um, a stipulation that the name needs to go up. And there's a great line from Arthur's longtime attorney who said, if you want your name on it, it's not charity. That's a contract. That's a business deal. And I was trying to understand it. And... Um, I stumbled on this episode that I think is very revealing, which is that during the Depression, Isaac Sackler, the original patriarch, the father of those three brothers, loses everything. And he gathers the brothers around him. And they're just boys at the time. And he he tells them, you know, I, you know, I want you to become doctors. I want you to, to get educated and have a great career. But I'm not able to pay for any of that. You're going to have to do it on your own. But he says, but I, you know, I have given you the, the most important thing that a parent can give a child. I've given you a good family name. And, you know, if you lose a fortune, you can always go out and earn another fortune. But if you lose your good name, you can never get it back. And to me, that was when I made that discovery of that moment, it kind of unlocked something. It was like, um, it was like Rosebud and Citizen Kane, right? It's, it's this, it's this little anecdote that explains almost a, uh, almost a century of behavior by this family. Because as soon as the, the brothers have the ability, they start giving money away and stipulating that the Sackler name, name needs to go up. And so I think some of it is about kind of honoring Isaac's wishes. I think some of it is about a, a sort of family branding exercise. Some of it is just an affectation of the rich. I mean, this is at a certain point when you've you know, when you've got a big house and a boat and a plane or whatever else, um, this becomes a way to measure yourself, you know, by it. Do, do you have a Picasso becomes the question, right? Um, but the sort of particular uh, fetish for naming, I think, is quite distinct to the Sacklers and to me really interesting. Yeah. And of course, when you quote that, that story, for the reader, there's a sense of foreboding because we know that more recently there have been galleries taking names down or certainly refusing to take more donations. I mean, that kind of prominence is in the end maybe used against the family by activists like artists like Nan Golden, who write about who, you know, did these kind of amazing performance art protests in galleries across the world to highlight um, the family's role in the opioid crisis. I mean, do you think that those activists played an important role in, in pushing the removal of the name? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think you're right. And you're, and you're touching on one of the ironies that I think I think people sometimes miss about this story, which is that you sometimes hear it suggested that um, that the naming thing was a, was an exercise in reputation laundering. And I, I think there's some truth to that. I mean, I think there's there's some truth to the idea that the family wanted to be associated with um beautiful art and and elite museums and cutting edge medical research and not with the the source of the family wealth when i i mean the most telling illustration for me was when i first started my research on this i went to the website of purdue pharma in 2017 and the company at the time was still owned by the sacklers and the sacklers dominated the board of directors 
but I looked and looked and looked for the family name on the website of the company and it wasn't anywhere. And that contrast was quite striking. At the same time, there is a sense, as you say, in which they, they kind of became an obvious target for some people, certainly for activists, uh, at the point where it was exposed that their fortune was linked to so much misery. And I, I think, honestly, if it weren't for activists like the photographer Nan Golden, who you mentioned, whose story I tell in the book, um, I don't know that there would have been the reckoning that we've seen. I, I wrote this piece in 2017 for The New Yorker, which is a big piece all about the Sacklers. There was another piece that came out almost at the same time in Esquire magazine. And in the aftermath of those two pieces, The New York Times called around to 21 cultural and educational institutions basically saying, hey, you've taken money from the Sacklers. How do you feel about this? And there wasn't a single institution in the aftermath of those pieces that put it, would put any distance between themselves and the Sacklers. They all seemed happy to either just duck the call or proudly say, as Oxford University did, um, we're very grateful for the, the tremendous philanthropy of the Sacklers. Um, it was really only after Nan Golden started this campaign in 2018 going out and doing big, colorful demonstrations at museums in the US, the UK, in Paris, I mean, really all over, um, that you started to see a, a sea change. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, we're going to open up to audience questions in a few minutes. So um, audience, get your questions in. Um, you can write in the Q&A box or um, tag them on social. I think it's IQ two is the is the hashtag but before we do that Patrick I really really I mean this is a little bit indulgent of me perhaps as a fellow journalist want to talk about your methods because I found it absolutely fascinating as you said at the top you had you know no cooperation in fact the very opposite of cooperation um from members of the family but you used a lot of legal documents and it doesn't read at all like you read any legal documents because, um, you know, you make it such a, a thrilling ride. But how did they help with your work? I love legal documents, I have to say. I, you know, it's funny. I went to law school. I, I trained as a lawyer be before becoming a journalist. Um, and uh, I, I don't uh, draw on my legal education with any frequency, but it, but it, it did teach me how to navigate a court docket. Um, I think the key for me as a, as a storyteller and somebody who wants to, to, uh, to write books that hopefully are engaging for people who aren't just, you know, have some special interest in this subject is, you know, if, if there's one thing that's frustrating for me as a reader, it's when I feel as though someone's gone out and done a huge amount of in-depth research. And then in the book, what they're doing is basically just pushing all that research across the table at me and saying, I read it, now Look you read it. it. <laughs> exactly. I hate that. And um, so for me, the challenge is distilling it. Um, but I, I think that you, particularly when you have a situation like this, in which you have a very secretive family that has uh, for decades availed itself of an army of attorneys and spin doctors and has been very, very good at um, kind of manicuring its own public image in ways that I think, in retrospect, most people would say were, were pretty deceitful. Um, court documents are great because what they do is they allow you to kind of crack open that world. And so for me, what that means is the family wouldn't talk to me, but I was able to get depositions where for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages, members of the family answer questions under oath uh, thousands of internal documents, including, you know, emails from a bunch of the family members that come out, a private family WhatsApp that the entire Mortimer Sackler family maintained for over a year, which looks probably like your family WhatsApp or mine, where you have different relatives talking about, you know, planning dinners and holidays and so on and so forth, but also talking about the pesky matter of all this press coverage of the opioid crisis. And to see the way in which they talk in private uh, is enormously helpful. You know, I was able to get letters and minutes from family meetings and all kinds of revealing stuff. And so for me, it, it's a strange thing to say, but in some ways that kind of material is actually more helpful than it would be if they said, yes, you can come in and have an interview and we're gonna be in a room with six lawyers and three PR specialists and uh, we'll constantly be going on and off the record it'll all be very scripted if that's the case. For me, the, to have access to 
um, these materials that come out in discovery, or I should say are sometimes leaked to me that don't come out through the court process, where I can see the way people talk in an unguarded manner, um, allows for just a much more intimate and honest uh, rendering of these people and, and how it is that they that they talk and see the world and, and move through the world. Oh, I'd definitely love to get into the WhatsApp messages of uh, anyone I was covering. Um, it's interesting you mentioned leaks, though, because that, that was kind of amazing. You said that at one point a thumb drive arrived and anonymously um, with a quotation from the Great Gatsby attached about careless people who let others clear up the mess. What did you think when you saw that? I didn't know what to think. It, the whole thing was so bizarre. It came in my mailbox um, and was addressed to me, but there was no uh, no post stamp. So um, so it had been dropped off at my house, which in and of itself was unsettling and weird. Um, and then, I mean, this is a funny story. I don't talk about this in the book, but you will appreciate this as a journalist, that I was quite paranoid uh, at this point for a variety of reasons. Um, and so when the thumb drive came, you better believe I didn't plug it right into my computer because what did I know? It could be, you know, malicious code. Um, but it was the, it was the pandemic. So I couldn't go to a copy shop or an internet cafe, uh, or a public library and use any sort of public computer. Um, so I ended up having to buy a, basically a burner laptop, a Chromebook, just for the purpose of, and not putting it on my Wi-Fi network. And then what I saw was there were thousands of pages of documents, which I didn't have before, and I wanted to print them out, but I couldn't print them on my computer. So I had to buy a burner printer just to uh, to do it. So it ended up, I mean, I still don't know to this day who who dropped it off. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that they, they weren't trying to put malware on my computer, but nevertheless, I haven't touched that uh, that Chromebook or that printer ever since. Wow. Yeah. I used to cover cybersecurity and I don't even think all of that would have occurred to me. So <laughs> um, very sensible. The other thing that I thought was intriguing about your methods was you, you write in your note on sources, how you were able to interview people who worked for the family from doormen to yoga instructors. Um, and, and I was just wondering, you know, how they were able to help and whether their sort of invisibility was a real asset there. Yeah, I I had to I tend to do a lot of interviews for anything that I'm working on, and um, I, I think that the bar is much higher when the people won't talk to you. They they sort of force you to get creative and to be thorough. Um, and so, you know, for this book, I interviewed more than 200 people, many of whom had worked for the family or known them professionally or known them socially. Um, and there was a certain kind of person who is a sort of uh, often domestic service provider um, who I was able to track down. And some of these people were incredibly helpful because if you think about it, they often have a very intimate vantage point on the lives of the people that they're working for. They're right there in the home and they remember these very dramatic moments and, and have kind of a front row seat for those. Uh, but often I think these people are also sort of overlooked um, by the family. And so that, that, you know, some of these, uh, these service providers who um, did their jobs for years. And I should say, you know, we're not all embittered at all. I mean, some of them, um, there was a housekeeper who worked for Mortimer Sackler Sr. Um, and had very fond memories of him and, you know, and, um, you know, did not, was not somebody who was talking as though she had an ax to grind, but there was a sort of vividness where there's a, a story I tell in the book about a terrible suicide and, um and she was there, you know, in the apartment that afternoon. And she was there when the memorial service happened. And to have that kind of account from somebody um, who's literally sent in to clean up after a suicide uh, is, I, I think it just, you know, it, it sort of brings it all home in a, in a, in a, in a very vivid and novelistic way. Yeah. Yeah, and it definitely is a, a vivid novelistic book. Right, so we're going to go to the audience questions. Um, if you um, have any, please do write them in the uh, under the video screen. Um, you need to click send, so check in case you wrote them and didn't click send. Um, or you can tweet um, questions with the hashtag IQ2. Um, the first question is... Has the Sackler story undermined the U.S. public's faith in the probity of the U.S. healthcare system? And if so, how can trust be restored? Mm -hmm. And that's from Jemima. 
Terrific question, Jemima. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'll be honest with you. I wrestled with this. This book came out uh, in the U.S. in April and in the U.K. in May. And um, at the point where I published it here, um, I had had my first shot of Pfizer and, and shortly thereafter got my second. And in the first third of the book, there's a story I tell about how Pfizer bribed a senior official at the FDA. So it's a strange moment in which to publish this book. On the one hand, I would argue that we should all have a healthy skepticism of the, uh, the motives um, of big pharma and also of the thoroughness and the integrity of the regulatory apparatus as it applies to big pharma. A lot of what this book is about is, is the way in which um, regulatory agencies are kind of captured by all that money and influence. On the other hand, uh, I don't think that that should tilt us into a kind of blanket skepticism about science, about the, um, you know, the power and the necessity of the vaccines. So it's an interesting issue because obviously vaccine hesitation is a huge, uh, huge problem here in, in the United States uh, and in other places as well, but, but, but a big issue here in the U.S. And honestly, I think the roots of that, I don't think it really grows out of the, the opioid crisis and the kind of the, the sort of break of trust associated with that, but I don't think that, that what happened with opioids helps. Um, so there are a bunch of different uh, cultural and political factors that I think are feeding into uh, the vaccine hesitancy issue here, not the least of which is the, the willingness that, that Donald Trump had to politicize uh, the issue of COVID generally and turn it into a, a partisan issue. Um, but I don't think it helps. And uh, I think restoring trust is, is going to take a while. Um, I will tell you that, you know, for the FDA in particular, I think that part of what would help would be if they acknowledged their own mistakes in the past. And I mentioned that guy, Curtis Wright, the official who approved OxyContin and then went, went to work at Purdue. Mm -hmm. I, um, I sued the FDA under the Freedom of Information Act to get a bunch of their documents and asked them to give me all of Curtis Wright's emails because I wondered, when did he start talking to the company about going to work there? And they came back to me. This is just last year. They came back and said that they couldn't give me any of his emails at all because they had all been lost or destroyed. So to me, that's not an agency that, um, that, is, that is, uh, has really learned from its past. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. I think that's also coming up in, in the sort of um, appointments uh, debates around the new commissioner. Um, okay, we have another question from Ravi, who's really sort of hitting the nail on the head here. Um, I'm not sure how um, exactly you're going to uh, apportion blame, but he asks, um, how much blame for the opioid crisis do you think lies at the door of the Sackler family? Might things have been different had they behaved differently? It's a great question. Thanks, Ravi. The, um, so the opioid crisis, as Hannah mentioned at the top, you know, it's, it's, it's a hugely complex public health crisis that has unfolded over 25 years and uh, has killed more than half a million people. And you don't get there because of any one bad actor. Uh, it, it, it takes a village, you know. To, I'm afraid to to achieve a catastrophe of this magnitude. So uh, the Sacklers would be quick to say, certainly, that the FDA signed off on the stuff that they did. That there were other pharmaceutical companies that also sold opioids. That um, and you know there there I think are you could you could argue that the uh, the doctors share a great deal of blame. The doctors who ever prescribed, uh, other authorities who um, didn't do what they should have done, the wholesalers, the uh, the pharmacy chains, and I think there's plenty of blame to go around. I think that the Sacklers and Purdue played a special role in the sense that OxyContin was really the first. It was the drug that changed the way in which these drugs were prescribed. There was a, a person who worked on OxyContin who said, and it's a line I use in the book, who I, I quote in the book saying that OxyContin was the tip of the spear. So there were many, many things that came afterwards. And I think it would be grossly reductive to uh, attribute you know, all of the blame for the opioid crisis to the Sackler family. At the same time, 
uh, I think it's very significant to look at their conduct and the conduct of their company early on. And that actually also along the way, as I mentioned earlier, it's that moment, you know, where what do you do when somebody comes and says that your product is killing people? How do you respond? And, you know, it's, I, I don't necessarily mean to suggest that they should have hit the brakes and said, we're going to take the drug off the market. But I do think that a little bit of self-reflection at that point, and Hannah, you said earlier, it was really, it was, you know, not even so much about the drug. It was about the marketing of the drug. That was the real issue. So there was a way in which they could have continued to sell OxyContin and it could have been, you know, used and, and made a, a great difference in the lives of pain patients, but they could have kind of turned down the marketing, stopped the exaggerated claims, um, stopped pushing it to the extent that they had been, and they didn't. And you get those junctures again and again and again in this story. So I think they, they, uh, they are, you know, they, they deserve a, a great deal of responsibility in those early years as a kind of first mover. Um, but that's not to say by any stretch that all of the blame can be left at their doorstep. Yeah. Now, Sarah has a, a good follow up question, which is, you know, um, the first part of which will be easy to answer and the second part much more complicated, I imagine. Um, she asks, did any of the Sacklers go to jail? And if not, could they in the future? So none of the Sacklers went to jail. Um, and none of them have been criminally charged with anything. Uh, I should say, in, in case we have any any Sackler lawyers in our midst uh, tuning in at the moment. Um, there have been civil charges uh, that were uh, federal civil charges that were settled by some members of the family. And then um, roughly half the states in the U.S. had lawsuits against uh, individual members of the family. Every state in the country was suing the company. Um, the the last third of the book is sort of how we got to where we are right now. And I, I can give you a very quick overview. But basically, um, in 2007, Purdue Pharma, the company pled guilty, as Anna mentioned, to federal criminal charges, paid a fine. Nobody went to jail. And they kind of kept on doing what they were doing. And in fact, actually ended up pleading guilty again in 2020 to new federal criminal charges. What happened, though, is that a couple of years ago, uh, with all of these lawsuits surrounding the company, I think about 3,000 lawsuits uh, over its role in the opioid crisis, they ended up putting the company into bankruptcy. And you might be wondering, you know, OxyContin made $35 billion in revenue over the decades. How is it that they could be declaring bankruptcy? And one reason is because of all these lawsuits. And then the other is that very quietly for about 10 years, the Sacklers had actually been pulling money out of their company sort of siphoning money out. They took more than $10 billion out of the company and then kicked it into bankruptcy. So you end up in this kind of crazy situation where all of these cases are going to be resolved in a bankruptcy court in White Plains, New York. And the Sacklers have not declared bankruptcy. And uh, the suggestion was rather than have all these different lawsuits go forward, we'll just resolve this thing in bankruptcy. The Sacklers will give up their interest in the company. Uh, they'll put up some money to help remediate the opioid crisis. And their proposal was uh, that the judge in the bankruptcy case would then give them a release from any future litigation uh, involving their role in the opioid crisis. And you may have seen the headlines, but that uh, earlier, I guess about a month ago, that that is where we ended up, is that they're going to pay $4.5 billion. They will acknowledge no wrongdoing. They'll give up their interest in Purdue. And this bankruptcy judge will essentially tell all those states that have sued the Sacklers, nope, your lawsuits can't move forward. You can never test those claims um, because I'm giving a release, a permanent release from any future civil liability to the family. So in theory, they, they to take the second part of your question, they remain, um, you know, they, they could be uh, pursued with criminal charges. I think in practice, those would be quite hard cases to bring. It seems unlikely that the federal Department of Justice will. So, you know, this is, I'm afraid, a story in which the bad guys get away with it in the end. I, you know, to me, that is sort of the way it was always going to end. The book, in a way, is not just about the Sacklers. It's about this system that has insulated them from so long. But that's where they are. They're going to pay over the next nine years. They'll pay $4.5 billion. Um, 
they have a fortune that's estimated to be about $11 billion now. And because they're paying the, for, the, the penalty out over nine years, they'll mostly be able to pay it with interest and investment returns. So there's a decent chance they'll be more rich when they're done paying than they are today. Wow. Well, that was a long but very thorough answer of what I knew was going to be a complicated answer to that question. <laughs> um, so the next question is, I uh, don't have a name, but it says, do you think the opioid epidemic has had an impact on politics? I read somewhere that many areas affected by opioids voted for Trump. Is there any truth in this? Well, it depends on how you look at it. So when the opioid crisis started, it did start in a particular kind of place. And this was in part because Purdue targeted these places with its marketing. So they were often um, kind of rural or rust belt type areas, white working class areas, places where uh, a lot of people, you know, had manual jobs or were out of work, had, you know, injuries they sustained on the job, had been treated for pain. And so that's where it starts to crop up in Appalachia, in, in Maine. Um, but eventually it spread. And so the, you know, the, the days when people referred to OxyContin as hillbilly heroin, and there was a sense that there was one demographic that uh, suffered from from this affliction, those are long gone. And at this point, uh, the opioid crisis is really in every part of the country. Um, it cuts across class, uh, it cuts across, across geography. I should also say the opioid crisis, when we talk about it, it, it has evolved. So what started out as a prescription pill problem is today largely a heroin and fentanyl problem. And if, if the Sacklers or their representatives were joining us today, they would say, look, this is a good example of why we've been misunderstood. You know, we never sold heroin or fentanyl. Um, but of course, it's a dynamic and evolving epidemic. And part of the issue is that you had this huge population of people whose on-ramp to opioids was FDA-approved painkillers. Then they became addicted. And at that point, they moved over to heroin or to fentanyl because they were you know, more powerful, easier to access, what have you. Um, so the complexion of the, of the crisis has changed. Um, you know, in terms of how it's affected politics, I don't know. It, it's, it's, um, <laughs> we would need a whole other conversation to explain uh, Donald, you know, the ascendancy of, of Donald J. Trump. Um, and I don't know that opioids uh, would, would be a, a really significant factor. But you, you're quite right that, the, um, that, that you, know, you, you could make that characterization about the, the early days of the crisis in those regions of the country. There are, of course, many books written on the ascendancy of Donald Trump, so you can buy them somewhere else. Exactly. Um, so the next question is, how did the American me medical establishment go along with the Sacklers? Are there any safeguards to stop another OxyContin destroying so many lives? Well, the, the medical establishment, I think, was seduced. You know, I tell the story in the beginning of the book about Arthur Sackler and how he realized that if you really want to sell drugs, the way to do it is not to target the patient, the consumer, it's to target the doctor who's writing the prescriptions. And Purdue did that really beautifully with OxyContin. They really figured out how to influence physicians. Um, strangely, I think part of the problem is that uh, physicians are often thought to be incorruptible. You know that they, they're thought of as as uh, kind of beyond that kind of influence. I, I've certainly talked to a lot of doctors who, in my own life who say, "Oh, I know that the pharma companies spend all this money, but of course, I would never be swayed by that sort of thing." Um, but you know, I, I respond by saying that Purdue Pharma, some years with OxyContin, would spend as much as nine million dollars a year just to buy food for doctors. And they knew, I mean, they spent that money because they knew they were getting a good return on investment. So it was really a, a kind of full spectrum assault on the medical profession. And I think today, if you talk to a lot of doctors, they would say that they were, you know, they were kind of, uh, they, they bought in all too quickly. Um, we've seen a, a correction, I think, in terms of uh, doctors reevaluating know, how they prescribe opioids, and some would argue an overcorrection, where in fact, the pendulum may have swung too far back the other way, where these drugs do have important medical uses. And there may be uh, patients suffering from terrible pain who now worry about access, because they worry that it went from, from the one to start with and to stay with, where they're just kind of firehosing the drug at anybody who asks for it, 
to something that's that's the opposite, where they're being too stingy. Um, so th these are exquisitely difficult uh, questions of medicine and, and policy, and and um, I do hope that uh, that we don't see this sort of thing happen again. Yes, yes, I think I think certainly with opioids there seems to have been a movement, but you can't anticipate what the what the next um, thing will be. Sort of right. Thing. Yeah. Um, so another question, this one's from Mike Leach. He says, tobacco companies also used financial inducements and lied persistently about the facts and the medical effects of smoking. Leaving aside the major point that opioids claim to be medically beneficial, what differences do you see between the two situations? And I would also add in there in terms of the two situations in terms of the settlement, because the tobacco settlement was gigantic and probably more than we're going to expect to see from opioid makers. Yeah, I mean, to, to me, the, the analogies are um, are pretty strong, uh, and you know, not least because I think that part of what um, part of what allowed both of these of these um, businesses to continue to flourish was a sense, and this is a, a particularly American idea, a kind of libertarian sense that. Um, that you can sell a dangerous thing and really it's kind of the, it's all the responsibility of the user. You know, guns don't kill people. People kill people. Uh, you also saw a situation with tobacco that then gets repeated with Purdue Pharma and opioids where when the market levels off in the U.S. because people, consumers kind of get wise to the risks, they start looking abroad and using the same playbook to, in the case of, of the Sacklers and Purdue, to sort of push the drug in places like China. Um, or Mexico or Brazil. So you, you see that analogy there. But to Hannah's point about the, um, the settlement, the tobacco industry is much bigger. And so there you had a, a huge settlement, much, much bigger. It really dwarfed uh, what you're going to end up coming up with uh, with the opioid crisis, not just for Purdue, but with all the companies combined. They will be able to generate less income to remediate the problems than the tobacco industry was. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I think we're heading towards our last question. Um, but this one, we return to that idea of the, the Sackler name. And um, the questioner asks, what does Patrick think about billionaire philanthropy in general? Can it ever be good? <laughs> oh, it's so hard. I, 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 I think, listen, I've, in, I've interviewed a lot of people who work at universities and, and uh, you know, in medical research and at art museums who say a dollar is a dollar. You know, if you, if you give me the money, I will I will spend it wisely and, and do good things with it. Um, I don't think it's quite that simple. And I think that there are real dangers. And one thing that was really revealing for me about this is when you when you kind of get into the under the hood and into the contracts and looking at um, the ways in which these relationships function, it is incredible the degree to which these institutions often are so subordinate to the donors. The donors really have their way with the institutions. Uh, in, in, and the power imbalance is just so striking and I think um, is sort of ripe for abuse. So I think there's good reason to be skeptical of uh, billionaire philanthropy. And I think that institutions need to think very, very hard about reputational risks, uh, what they're endorsing, you know, what price they're willing to pay for the funds that they take. And I think it's useful to have people like Nan Golden out there because it kind of keeps them honest. Certainly in my own conversations with a lot of these institutions, um, I sometimes think they, they knew that the money was toxic. They were just hoping that nobody would notice. And I don't think for any institution that that's a, a strong, viable, long-term position. I think you sort of need to decide where you stand um, and, then, and then stick with it. Uh, so again, I, I wouldn't say that um, that you know we should do away with billionaire philanthropy altogether, but it's a bit like my position on on big pharma and pharma regulation. I think if you're not uh, exercising a very healthy skepticism, you're not thinking about it hard enough. Well, thank you, Patrick, for producing I don't know, 600 pages of very healthy skepticism, um, and. Um, you know, really taking us through tonight how we should be thinking about remaking the farmer industry and remaking um, philanthropy. Thank you to the audience for some brilliant questions. And yeah. thank you for Intelligence Squared for organizing.